Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Streets of New Capenna spoilers, and I know it's a weekend, but spoiler season, it doesn't stop, and we got some really sweet stuff to talk about, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking interesting new Streets of New Capenna cards. Before we do, two quick reminders. Number one, if you want to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you'll find them all over at mtdpreviews.com. Number two, if you need some Streets of New Capenna cards, or really any cards, you can get them from our awesome sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to cardkingdom.com slash mtdgoldfish and even get a free goldfish sticker. Just let them know you want one in your order notes, and they will hook you up. Anyway, let's talk Streets of New Capenna. First up today, we got a Blue Mythic and All Seeing Arbiter. So a six mana, five, four avatar with flying. It says when it enters the battlefield or attacks, draw two cards, then discard a card. And then whenever you discard a card, target creature in opponent controls. Gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the number of different mana values among cards in your graveyard. So All Seeing Arbiter, definitely feels like a limited bomb like in limited this card seems absolutely absurd like borderline unbeatable i guess it doesn't have any sort of protection but still this does a ton it's shutting down your opponent's best threat it's drawing you cards it's giving you a big flyer to finish the game so i think this is a very high pick in limited and constructed well, I don't know. I think it's more okay than really strong. If you think about what this does, it's ETB and attack trigger isn't bad. It's a catalog, essentially. Draw two, then discard a card. And then, of course, since you're discarding a card, you're triggering the second ability to shut down one of your opponent's threats, hopefully, assuming you had a bunch of mana values in your graveyard, which is kind of like a weird twist on spontaneous mutation. We've never had cards before New Capenna that care about the different mana values in your graveyard. So that's something brand new, uh, not as powerful is just caring about the number of cards in your graveyard, because obviously the number of different mana values is going to be less, but still, I mean, that's not a bad effect on a 5-4 flyer for 6. It's a lot of value in different little ways. I think that this is intended to be a card to work with the connive mechanic, and I think that's probably where it could shine the most in standard. Like, if you got something like Rafine going to do a bunch of drawing and discarding, this is potentially shutting down your opponent's entire team until your next turn, like, fogging your opponent's entire attack while also drawing you cards while also giving you a big body at the same time it is six mana and that is a lot of mana and its stats for being six mana are kind of middling rather than great but i do think maybe there's some sort of conniving control style deck a uh, connive creature control that could really take advantage of all seeing arbiter another possibility is using this in reanimator because this is a way to fill your graveyard we got a lot of options for this thanks to connive i don't think you want this to be your reanimator finisher i still think you're going to be trying to get a tox rule or a coma or jing attack is there a hole break around the battlefield but it's a support piece that comes down loots fills your graveyard gets something big in the graveyard and then potentially shuts down an attacker or two to buy you some time until you can get your bigger thing online uh, it seems pretty strong especially if you're using like faithful mending other drawn discard effects you could be shutting down your opponents entire your team on repeat although all saying arbiter is just still a threat that dies to removal like it doesn't have any protection so that's something to keep in mind it seems strong in the right shell as long as it sticks on the battlefield, but there's really no guarantee it's going to stick on the battlefield in every matchup. Once you get to other formats, it's pretty cute with cycling. I'm almost wondering if in like historic or maybe in pioneer or modern, we could see some sort of cycling control deck. Like you got Archfiend of Ifnir, which when you discard a park card, you put a negative one, negative one counter on each creature your opponents control. Now we got All Seeing Arbiter. We got payoffs like Drakehaven. Maybe you just play these, let Archfiend deal with the little go wide threats, let All Seeing Arbiter deal with the big go tall threats and then try to close out the game with the big flyers or with drake haven i don't know how successful that plan would be but all the pieces are there to make some sort of cycling control deck work and all seeing arbiter would be perfect for that deck you can be discarding it instant speed like how do you attack with this on the battlefield if you're playing a deck full of cycling cards like no one's going to be able to attack you because if they attack you you're just like okay i cycle a card i make your thing essentially lose all of its power and then i eat it with my all seeing arbiter so it seems incredibly strong once it's on the battlefield if it sticks out in the right deck as far as commander is concerned i think there's two homes for it one is wheel decks this seems really good in wheel decks because remember decks like nekusar or zyrus or locust god they're playing a bunch of wheel of fortune style effects they are drawing and discarding tons of cards each turn you cast a wheel of fortune you're potentially discarding seven cards drawing seven new cards or like nekusar is doing that on its own and all seeing arbiter is essentially just going to be shutting down the board like it's fizzling all the attacks until your next turn which is going to buy you a ton of time 
trying to do whatever you want to do. Make a bunch of snakes with your Zyrus or make a bunch of tokens with your Locust Guide. However you want to win the game. So it seems like an all-star in wheel style decks. The other place is cycling decks like Gavi or Sephiroth. If you're cycling, the same thing we just talked about in Constructed is going to ring true in Commander as well. Going to be really tough for anyone to attack you with this out because they're not going to know. Your opponent's not going to know. If you can just cycle a card, eat their attacker, blow them out in combat. So all seeing Arbiter, I think it's better than it looks. I think this is an all-star in limited. I think that it has some potential in standard in the right shell. And I'm really excited to see what it can do in a cycling deck in older formats. Again, at six mana, I don't think it's busted or anything, but in a cycling deck, it seems really strong. Plus in those shells we talked about, really good in commander too. We also got another hideaway card in Fight Rigging. So Fight Rigging, three mana hideaway enchantment, hideaway five. And it says at the beginning of combat, on your turn put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control and then if you control a creature with power seven or greater you can play the XL card without paying its mana cost so a hideaway just as a refresher you play this you look at your top five cards you get to exile one of them and that's the card you get to play for free if you meet the hideaway restrictions so fight rigging I think it's the best new hideaway card that we've seen so far. We talked about the blue one that's five mana and it like draws you a card each turn. You need nine cards in hand to trigger it. That one seemed really bad. This one though actually seems pretty achievable. Getting a creature to seven power doesn't seem like that big of a challenge, especially since Flight Rigging is going to be adding counters to it as well. So really, uh, if you play this, you only need a six power creature because this is going to get you that seventh power. And if it sits out on the battlefield for a couple of turns, it's going to grow your creature big enough to turn itself on anyway. So this compares to Moss Warp Bridge. Moss Warp Bridge, one of the original hideaway cards, it was a land that required you to have 10 or greater power. And 10 is a lot more than seven. And of course, Moss Warp Bridge doesn't do Flight Rigging to help you grow your cards. On the other end, Moss Warp Bridge, easier to play because it's just a land, so it's taking up a land slot. But I still think that Fight Rigging can be way easier than Moss Warp Bridge. In Standard, it's kind of exciting because it's a little bit like a weird Luminarch Aspire. We've seen the beginning of combat, plus one, plus one counter trigger from Luminarch Aspire, be incredibly strong. You're getting that value right away. In Fight Rigging, why it's not coming attached to a body, which is a bit of a drawback, it's going to do the same thing. You play this, put a counter on something right away, be able to get in a little extra damage, and work towards casting something for free with its hideaway cost and there's plenty of ways in standard to just rush a creature up to seven power we see this happen all the time with enchantment decks with Kami of Transients or Generous Visitor we just played not that long ago a modify deck with Orin Refuse which also with plus one plus one counters would get its creatures up to seven power really quickly you got stuff like Demigoth Titan or Demigoth Woe Eater that are just big enough to turn fight rigging on all by itself you can even use pump spells like Machiko's Reign of Truth as a way to turn a creature into a big enough threat to turn on your fight rigging and cast something for free so really, this doesn't seem hard to me. Like, it doesn't seem that hard, and Fight Rigging is doing something before you get to 7 power and turn it on anyway with the plus 1, plus 1 counters. And then once you get back to whatever, historic, modern, pioneer, you get all kinds of options. Like Death Shadow, often 7 or more power for 1 mana. Tarmogoyf can grow up to 7 power easily. Rotting Regisaur, a scale up is going to get the job done. You turn a creature into 6-4, put the counter on it, that's 7 power. So any creature with scale up is going to turn this on, and then you can hope to, like, jam an Emrakul into play and standard jam a Hole breaker whore into play. Although I do wonder if the decks that want fight rigging are going to try to play these really big things or if they're just going to use it for value, like just casting another Tarmogoy for Rotting Regisar or Kamiya Transients or Demigoth Titan, that might be enough to make this work. I'm a little worried if you go on the full on like me mode of like, all right, I'm going to try to get an Emrakul into play with my fight rigging. You might run into a little bit of the Satoru Yumazawa problem. If you've ever tried to build a Satoru deck, you run into this weird situation where you need these like evasive one drops to ninjutsu, but then you need these big things to put into play with Satoru Yumazawa's ninjutsu ability. Then he needs Satora, so you have this really clunky shell, and I kind of wonder if Fight Rigging could run into that problem as well. Like, in Standard, if you're playing a bunch of, like, uh, Enchantress stuff, and that's how you're getting to 7 power, are you really going to play a Hull Break or in your deck, a Coma in your deck, that you're not really going to reasonably be able to cast without Fight Rigging? I'm not sure, but I don't think you need to do that. So you can go full-on me mode, play this along with Mossmort Bridge, try to make just, like, the hugest thing possible as quick
quickly as possible but i think it's also just fine as a value card and then if you want to go even deeper maybe in commander maybe in modern maybe wherever you want to you can always reset this by blinking it like teferi's time twist once you cast the first card that's exiled with fight rigging then you can blink fight rigging hide away something else and then cast that card because you're already gonna have a creature that's big enough to turn it on so uh flicker with felidare guardian you could potentially be casting a lot of free spells with this card in the right shell so fight rigging the best new hideaway card we've seen so far i'm excited to build the full-on like try to get emerical into play try to get the biggest thing possible into play deck uh, that'll probably be more of an against odds deck but again i don't think you have to do that to make fight rigging good because we've seen the plus one plus one counter on combat ability be really strong and it seems pretty easy to turn this on and just get some free value out of it and then it stays on the battlefield and keeps adding counters and if you can reset it even better next up we got a new casualty rare in cut your losses so six mana silver three casually two if you sack something power to a greater when you cast it you get another copy of it target player mills half their library rounded down so this is essentially casualty traumatize it's essentially casualty kick mode of maddening kickophony how good milling half your opponent's library is really varies on your deck i think this is in effect that is often overrated by players and if you really think about how copying milling half your opponent's deck works it makes it even less exciting let's say your opponent has 60 cards in their deck just because that's what you start with obviously you're going to draw cards it's not going to be the real number but let's say you actually casualty a cut your losses the first one's going to mill your opponent for 30 then they got 30 cards then the next one's going to resolve and it's not going to mill 30 more cards it's going to mill half of the 30 cards so then they're going to have 15 cards and that's fine that's good especially if you're a dedicated mill deck if you're a dedicated mill deck then that's great because then you can use a maddening cacophony or whatever a ruin crab to close out the game on the other hand this isn't just gonna kill your opponent by itself even if you mill your opponent down to five cards in their library or something that's still potentially five turns of your opponent being able to kill you before you actually mill them out so keep that in mind cards like traumatize outside of dedicated combos traditionally aren't super heavily played in mill decks uh maddening cacophony kind of the exception because of the kicker mode like you can just cast it as a two mana mill eight and then some situations you might end up actually kicking it and milling half your library so as far as cut your losses i think what makes it a little bit exciting is we do have some good mill support in standard like we have ruin crab we have maddening cacophony we have tasha's hideous laughter and if you take what we were talking about before the problem with cut your losses is that even if you casualty it your opponent's gonna have 10 cards in their library five cards 15 cards depending on the situation if you have another mill spell a maddening cacophony a tasha's hideous laughter even a ruin crab in some lands you're probably going to be able to finish your opponent off the following turn and that is actually super super strong i'm not sure what your standard mill deck is sacrificing for casualty but we'll figure that out later so in a dedicated mill deck this can be really good also worth noting this has target players so this could be a way to mill yourself to get bench finds in the graveyard or try to win with jace wielder of mysteries six mana definitely a lot for this effect uh that is a lot that i don't know if that that'll actually make it in a format like modern but if you're trying to pull off some of these janky combos worth keeping in mind it is an upside that you can target yourself with it the other way this card can be really good if you can just straight up combo with it with cards like burvac or frank sanity either of these cards is either an insta kill or gonna put your opponent to like one card in their library depending on how many cards is in your opponent's deck odd or even starting amount of cards because of the rounded down thing but like burvac if an opponent would mill one or more cards they mill twice that many instead so then you don't even need to casually cut your losses you have burback out you play cut your losses you milled 30 and then burback mills 30 more that's going to be your opponent's entire library same with frang sanity it's essentially a burback on an enchantment so if you want to try to combo off this is another traumatize it's another kicked maddening cacophony to give you redundancy in your deck we haven't really seen a deck with this combo take off in a 60 card format but definitely worth keeping in mind in your burback commander deck at least and who knows maybe now thanks to cut your losses giving more redundancy maybe it's the time to actually try this deck in modern or in historic or something the other place you'll play it is in just mill commander decks phoenix or anwan or michael vosh if your goal is to mill your opponent's deck this is a great option for your deck in commander you're probably gonna have something to sacrifice you can even split it up so you can mill half of one player's library half of another player's library and then maybe you got your burback or your uh frame sanity and then you just finish off both players like all at once like that seems incredibly powerful potentially being able to kill two players in one turn in your commander deck so cut your losses it's a fun card it's cool to see this style of mill effect coming back we will definitely play it i don't expect it to be a top tier card in standard but 
in the right shell, it's definitely a powerful effect, and I love how casually works in Commander, allowing you to split up the milling between two different players. Solves one of the biggest problems with a card like Traumatize, where you're just targeting one person, being able to hit two people with it makes it so much better. We also got a sneaky little blue one drop in Errant Street Artist. So Errant Street Artist, one mana zero three, human rogue legend with flash, defender, and haste. One of the weirdest lines of text you'll see on a magic card. Defender and haste always so wonky but the reason it has defender and haste or at least haste is it has a sweet activated ability you can pay one in a blue tap it to copy target spell you control that wasn't cast and you may choose new targets for your copy so you're probably wondering wait a minute copy a spell that wasn't cast how am i getting spells that aren't cast the answer is this essentially copies copies of things if you're playing standard uh you're cut to profits or any casualty cards the copy of it is going to be a spell that you didn't cast and then you're going to be able to use errant to copy that or galvanic iteration you galvanic iteration something you get the copy on the stack then for two mana and tapping errant can copy the copy again although it is worth pointing out not everything that looks like it copies spells actually does does. So it's really important to read the text on the cards. Uh, copy effects that exile the cards like Arcane Bombardment or Isochron Scepter, they tend to have you cast the copy. Sometimes they have you cast the copy without paying its mana cost, which works almost exactly the same as just copying it. But the formatting means Errant Street Artists wouldn't be able to copy it. It doesn't say copy a spell that was copied. It says copy a spell that wasn't cast. So your Isochron Scepter is casting a spell, even though it's casting a copy. Your Arcane Bombardment is casting the spell even though it's casting copies so that's something to keep in mind it works with most of the things you want but if you're building a deck around this just make sure to read your effects closely because there's going to be something that you want to have in your deck and then when you read it you're like oh wait a minute Aaron doesn't actually copy that the other thing that's really sweet about this card is it doesn't specify instance of sorcery spells or non-creature spells so Aaron's a way you can copy a double major copy or a lithoform engine copy or a volo copy or a jingataxius copy like imagine having your lithoform engine out and copying a permanent and then why that copy is still on the stack for two more mana using errant to copy the permanent again same with double major volo or jingataxius you know copying artifacts so there's some really fun just cool things you can do with this card i love doubling up things and this is a sneaky way to double up very specific narrow subset of spells the things that are copied but still it is pretty cheap it is pretty efficient it's only one mana it's only due to activate so i'm excited to play it with some of these cards and just see what happens another play this is going to be really sweet i think is in the demir token or grixis token deck this is a deck that i'm really high on seeing all the casualty cards that we're getting in new capenna like grizzly sigil and a little chap i feel like there's got to be some sort of demir grixis sedgemore witch papa stitcher deck we're using witch and papa stitcher to make the cards that you can casualty away make these tokens that you don't really want anyway and then you can use those to pay for casualty and then you add errant street artists into the mix and all of a sudden you're a little chat is just like drawing you a ridiculous number of cards and you're making a ridiculous number of tokens with your sedgemore witch because it triggers whenever you cast or copy a spell thanks to magecraft so i'm excited to try this deck as well there is a question though in a lot of decks would you rather have errant or just another copy of an actual copying effect like is errant better than just playing another galvanic iteration or another reverberate the answer is in some decks it might be but in other decks it probably wouldn't be like if you're just trying to uh, to go back to a band deck if you're trying to just copy a elrin's epiphany a bunch of times you're probably going to be better off just playing an additional copy of galvanic iteration rather than trying to go through the shenanigans with errant because the upside of like galvanic iteration is sometimes you just copy a i don't know unexpected windfall or something a removal spell even when errant's not going to be able to do that as far as commander is concerned you could play this in any deck that has a lot of effects that copy things but really i think it goes with specific spell copying commanders i'm looking at like calamax riku a uh, character thumbless melek viran a uh, volo that we talked about earlier if your commander's ability and what you're trying to do with your deck is copy spells or even creature spells i think that Aaron's going to be a really really easy inclusion in your deck it's only one mana it's efficient and since it has haste you can do this all at instant speed like for three total mana you can flash this in and activate it without giving your opponent to kill it with removal or anything so you're likely to at least get one copy off of it anyway so if you're playing a copy deck i think this card's gonna be worth it so errant 
I really like it. Might be more of a meme build around, but with all the casualty stuff we got going on in Standard, it might actually have a chance to be pretty good as well, and definitely has a lot of different commander homes. Next up, we got what might be the most powerful card from the set so far, or at least one of them, in Professional Facebreaker, a 3 mana 2 3 human warrior with menace, and it says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token, and then sack a treasure, exile the top card of your library, you may play it this turn this card is absolutely oh my goodness ridiculous so on level one it makes treasures and it triggers whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage so it doesn't have to be professional phrase baker itself which means you can play a two drop on turn two turn three play this attack immediately get the treasure which is nice that is a nice bonus most importantly it allows you to turn your treasures into cards which is an inherently powerful ability treasures making mana is great but you know what's even better having the option to either draw a card with your treasure or make mana with your treasure because there's certainly times and i've seen this happen in standard or in commander where you make a ton of treasures and you're just unable to use them all effectively this is a way that if you don't need the mana it can turn into cards i also gotta say I kind of love the flavor of this card. Kind of the, the enforcer, going to collect the debt and beating treasures out of people's faces. So really love the top-down flavor of this card as well. So this reminds me of a couple different groups of cards. For one, it kind of reminds me of like Captain Lannery Storm, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, these red three drops that can make treasures. Uh, of course, Professional Face Breaker needs to actually get in combat damage or it needs something to get in combat damage. Well, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Captain Lannery Storm just need to attack. But still, similar there, another comparison is tireless tracker for treasures tireless tracker gives you clues and then you can turn those clues into cards professional face breaker gives you treasures but allows you to turn your treasures into cards and we've seen tireless tracker be an all-star all the way back to modern so it's a really really powerful effect so professional face breaker compares to a lot of good cards one place i'm hyped to play it and i know this is like the worst possible home but a while ago we played kaya storm oh my goodness and that deck just does crazy crazy things and the whole goal of the deck is to manipulate the game into a state where you can go off with Storm Kiln Artist and Kaya to like double your treasures and Goldspan Dragon to have your treasure sack for two mana. And you can literally make hundreds of treasures. Like when the deck goes off, you play through your whole deck, you make hundreds of treasures. Professional Facebreaker is absurd for that deck. It does exactly what you want because one of the ways things go wrong for the Treasure Storm deck is that you make a ton of treasures, but you fizzle on your card draw and you have all these treasures. You have like a hundred mana but you don't have anything to do with it if you add professional face breaker into the mix now those hundred treasures can be mana if you need them or you can just draw your entire deck and keep the storm turn going so even though i don't think this is going to make treasure storm tier one or anything it is a great addition to that archetype and if you're looking for something fun to play going off with treasure storm is just wow one of the sweetest things you can do in standard however you don't need to be doing janky against the odds things to make professional face breaker good if you look at standard one of the hallmarks of our current standard is treasure production, Shambling Yes, Prosperous Innkeeper, Magda's, Unexpected Windfalls, Fable the Mirror Breaker. So many decks are making treasures in some form or another, and we have seen treasures just be incredibly strong, ramping in colors that don't usually get to ramp. And now you got Professional Face Breaker, which is going to work with your treasure production plan, but then also give you a way to turn those into cards. So I think this has a home in potentially many, many different decks in standard. Once you get back to older formats, you got even more great crazy things. You got ways to go off with Academy Manufacturer. I don't know if you remember the combo deck we played with Chatterfang and all the weird counter productions Lannis right after Modern Horizons 2 came out. A professional facebreaker would be great there. You can make clues, you can make food, and those are going to give you treasures, and then the treasures become cards that find you more clues and food and treasures, so you keep the snowball going. We got stuff like Pitiless Plunder. We've had some Pitiless Plunder infinite combo decks. Professional facebreaker works well there. I mean, Ragavan, this stupid monkey, one of the best cards in Modern. What does it do? It makes treasures having the option to turn those treasures into card draw seems really really good and then oh my god commander i think this card's kind of absurd i mean it's absurd on its face like in commander you got three opponents so you can play this and if you can attack and hit each opponent you're gonna get three treasures it only costs three mana so it's kind of a free spell on the first turn it comes into play and then it gives you option for card advantage and all that stuff but so it's really really good just in an absolute sense on the other hand it is absurd with dockside extortionist dockside extortionist is 
probably honestly just too good for Commander. Like, uh, if there's one card I would say I would consider banning in Commander, it's probably Dockside, because Dockside just accidentally combos off. It just accidentally goes infinite. It accidentally makes 20 treasures, 30 treasures. It's, it is absurd. And there's been so many games where I've had Dockside in my deck in Commander, and I haven't even tried to combo with it, and I'm just like, oh, look at this. This I can sack my Dockside, and then I'll Eternal Witness it and get it back and make 30 more treasures. Now, if you had Professional Face Breaker to the mix, it gets even more absurd. Now those 30 treasures, if you don't need them for mana, you turn into cards to find something to spend your treasure mana on. So I imagine if you can ever get both of these cards together on the battlefield in a game of Commander, you're probably going to have a really, really good time. Uh, as far as specific homes in Commander... I think this is good enough that I would just play it in random red decks. Like, honestly, three treasures to turn by attacking each player and the random synergies we've been talking about, I think it's good enough just as a generic card, but it goes up in value, of course, in decks that care about treasures. Magda, Galazeth, Prismari, Breaches, and Malcolm, Kaelin. The other place it is a really natural fit is going to be Prosper Tomebound. Uh, Prosper, it's almost like Professional Facebreaker was built for Prosper. Prosper makes treasure tokens and wants you to play stuff from X Style, and Professional Facebreaker does both of those things. Now you can cast cards from Exile thanks to Professional Facebreaker, and those will make treasures, and then you can either use those treasures to cast more cards, or you can turn them into card draw with Professional Facebreaker, which is then going to give you more cards in Exile to cast with Prosper to make more treasures. So it's not like an infinite combo, but the value potential is really, really high. So Professional Facebreaker... This card is just, it's insane. It's so good. It is so incredibly good. I expect we're going to see this in Standard, in Historic, maybe in Pioneer and Modern, definitely in Commander. It is just one of the strongest cards that we've seen from Streets of New Capenna so far. We also got a few low rarity spells worth going over real quick. Starting with Mage's Attendant, 3 mana, 3, 2 cat rogue. When it enters the battlefield, make a 1-1 one, one blue wizard creature token with pay 1 sack it, counter a non-creature spell unless its controller pays 1. I think this card's pretty reasonable. If you think about what it does, it kind of compares to Catacomb Sifter, Brea's Apprentice. These three drops that come along with a 1-1 one, one token friend. Uh, with Mage as a tenant, you're getting four power, three toughness across two bodies. And then the token's kind of like a twist on Curse Catcher. You do need mana to activate it, which is a bummer. But hitting any non-creature spell, rather than just instants or sorcery, so you can get Planeswalkers or maybe a Saga in standard, a vehicle hitting an artifact in standard, is a nice little bonus. So I think that this is just a reasonable card, especially if you're a token deck or have some other synergy for getting multiple bodies out of one card but really four power three toughness a little bit upside countering stuff seems pretty sweet also worth mentioning it can be a mono white card so you're kind of getting a counter uh, an on board counter that players are going to be able to play around but that's something you can do in a mono white deck so maybe this is a way to prevent the wrath when you're playing white weenie against a control style deck so i actually really like this card a lot and think it's got a chance in constructed we also have rob the archives an insane source of card advantage if you can use it and if for the right deck two mana casualty of one exile the top two cards of your library you may play those cards this turn so rob the archive if you can casualty it, is draw four for two mana. The only downside is you gotta spend those cards this turn. Uh, similar effects like Reckless Impulse usually give you two turns until the end of your next turn. So there is a pretty strict timing restriction, but still, sack your eye twitch, draw four. That's a ridiculous burst of card advantage. So I think this card's got a shot to see play fairly. Like, imagine this off the top in the late game where you sack your random 1-1 one -one and just essentially be able to flood the board, refill your hand for that one turn that seems powerful and maybe it's got some combo potential as well seems great for like a storm deck some sort of big turn combo deck if you can find a way to pay the casualty cost speaking of crazy casualty stuff we also got grizzly sigil one mana sorcery casualty one so again you attack your eye twitch any of the random one ones and it says choose target creature or planeswalker if it was dealt non-combat damage this turn it deals three damage to it and you gain three life otherwise it deals one damage to it and you gain one life so by itself without casualty card is really bad but with casualty it's actually really really strong because what you can do is you cast grizzly sigil you casualty it sacking your eye twitch or whatever the first copy is going to ping something for one and that's going to turn on the second copy for dealing the three so all together you can deal four damage and gain four life for one mana if you casualty this and when you consider that like essence extraction three mana three damage gain three life 
Saw a decent amount of play not that long ago in Standard. I think in a sack deck where you can use this, the floor is Sideboard All-Star against Aggro, and the ceiling is four of main deck style removal spell, especially if you're playing a deck that can get value out of sacking stuff. If you want your Eye Twitch to die, if you want your Shambling Gas to die, or whatever, you got useless Decay Zombies from Jadar. So I think the Grizzly Sigil, and honestly a lot of these casualty cards just seem really, really strong. We also got security rocks four mana five four except you can pay it for two mana but only using treasure mana so this is kind of like a new twist on mirror superior way above the curve but a restriction on how you can cast it the good news isn't standard we got decks that are going shambling gas deadly dispute two extra treasures on turn two you can be casting security rocks on turn two and also refilling your hand with your you know deadly dispute card draw or you can just play it more fairly with kaylin or prosperous innkeeper playing security rocks like turn three and in standard even in 2022 a turn two five four is a pretty big deal. You can also support it in a format like Modern with Strike at Ridge or Ragavan. Although in Modern, the problem is, I don't think a 5-4 for two, a vanilla creature, is actually that interesting. So even though you can get it down quickly, I don't know if it's actually gonna be that good. We also got Cormelia Glamour Thief, a new Grixis Uncommon Legend. It's a four mana, two four with haste. You can pay one to add a blue, black, and red mana, but only spend that mana on instant or sorcery spells. And then when it dies, you get to return one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand so cormelia played fairly pretty meh i guess you can ramp into your whatever cruel ultimatum or something but the most exciting part of this card is its combo potential so there are several different ways involving uh, a way to reanimate Cormelia, a sacrifice outlet, and a way to make a mana to pay for Cormelia's mana making ability that you can just go infinite with this. So here's an easy one that's historic legal. Demonic Gifts. Two mana instant, uh, it pumps a creature. More importantly, it says when this creature dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So the idea is you can play Cormelia, you can make mana, enough mana to cast your Demonic Gifts, targeting Cormelia, and then you can sack Cormelia to something like Immerstorm, predator cormelia is going to die it's going to return a spell to your hand well that spell can be demonic gifts uh, and then cormelia is going to come back into play because of the first demonic gifts and then you can use cormelia again to make mana and demonic gifts and then you throw in a meat hook massacre or a blood artist or something and drain your opponent out of the game it is important to point out though you see the pitiless plunder over there you do need a source of mana that isn't cormelia to pay the one to make the three with cormelia so that's where pitiless plunder comes in when cormelia dies it's going to make a treasure your token but keep that in mind you can't use the one from cormelia to pay to make three uh, because it only works for instant or sorcery spells but that's one way you can go infinite with it once you get back to commander it's even easier like gorio's vengeance corpse dance shallow grave any of these reanimation spells you got astronaut's altar so you can sack cormelia to the altar to make two mana after making cormelia's mana of course use cormelia's mana to gorio's vengeance to get back the cormelia then you do it again and again and again and you make infinite mana maybe you win with blood artist or you scry through your deck with viserys here also works with exhume just like exhume ashnod's altar cormelia gonna give you infinite death triggers infinite etb triggers so cormelia seems like a pretty interesting combo piece we'll have to see how good it is it does take a lot of pieces but especially in commander if you want to build around this there's definitely plenty of ways to go infinite we also got speaking of push casualty stuff make disappear two mana instant casualty one counter target spell unless it's controller pays two so this is a quench which we know isn't very good quench was pretty disappointing in standard however if you casualty it it upgrades into a lookouts dispersal essentially uh being able to counter a spell unless his controller pays four or i guess pays two twice is actually pretty close to a howard counter a lot of the time so we'll have to wait and see i think if something like that grixis sack grixis token deck becomes a thing this is probably going to be a key counter spell for that deck you do gotta have the fodder to really make it good but again that just doesn't seem that hard in current standard otherwise there's a bunch of other lower rarity stuff not gonna get into it all most of it's limited only but you can find them all over at mtgpreviews.com if you want to check them out for yourself anyway that brings us to the end of our daily Streets of New Capenna spoilers for today. So let me know what you think. How hyped are you for these new cards? What are you going to do with these cards? How are you liking this set so far? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back tomorrow with more daily Streets of New Capenna spoilers. So until then, have a great day.
and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.